today so thank you first and foremost for inviting me uh, and also uh, uh, presenting the associateship to me uh, last year so uh, today i'll speak on uh, the statistical analysis, analysis of functional data and so <coughs> i have uh, so as instructed i have based my talk very loosely uh, keeping uh, the technical details as minimal as possible but obviously one cannot avoid all the all of the technical details so start with the uh, statistical analysis of functional data so start with let's go through brief, briefly as what is uh, functional data all about uh, essentially uh, what i do as part of my research work so functional data is where you have uh, data points which are essentially functions or curves instead of having uh, like univariate data or standard multivariate data which is mostly common in statistics uh, so data of this kind where you have uh, individual data points to be functions or curves uh, such are called functional data now examples could be you have growth curves for boys and girls you could have temperature curves over a, a year for various weather stations you could have hip and knee angles in a, over or through a gait cycle and there could be other other ex examples as well okay and uh, one can also look at what are called uh, neo functional data these days or the new generation fun functional data where you could have more complex objects like images and surfaces and so on and so forth like uh, one particular example is uh, brain images obtained from an, from an mri study uh, so all of these uh, constitute functional data okay now uh, obviously uh, so this is an this is an example of a, the first picture that I have uh, for you. So these are like genetics data, data sets uh, where you have age and the velocity. So this is the, the so I mentioned about the growth curves. So these are the growth velocity curves. As you can see, each data point essentially is a fully observed function. Okay. So one needs to be very careful as to how to develop statistical methods when you have data of this kind okay the other example could be in handwriting ana analysis where people have written down fda that's functional data anal analysis and several people have, have written it down and we want to compare how their handwritings match up okay this could also be used in uh, forgery uh, situations where you could have a forged handwriting and then you could compare it with the baseline handwriting to understand whether or not it's a forgery okay. Uh, other examples come from biophysics, uh, from brain imaging, from energy uh, physics, from environmentrics where you have temp temperature curves. So all of these uh, complicated data sets are what functional data analysis constitutes of. Okay. So obviously uh, because um, each curve is, is essentially, it's a, each, each data point is essentially a function. So the atoms or the basic building blocks of functional data analysis inherently infinite dimensional in nature okay um, so because they, these each data point is inherently infinite dimensional in, in nature so we need to be very careful as to how to do statistical analysis okay and it this poses new challenges and new techniques have to be developed to come up with statistical methods for the and for the analysis of such kind of data i mean these are very different from your standard multivariate or vector valued data where you can maybe do like a dot product and so on and so forth and then have addition of vectors and things like that okay. and also uh, because we are now basing our models in infinite dimensional probability spaces or infinite dimensional spaces one need to now talk about probability distributions on infinite dimensional spaces uh, statistical methods on infinite dimensional spaces so the things get a bit more com complicated okay. Uh, so three essential things which play a very important role in trying to understand or trying to develop statistical methods for such data are these three things. One is the geometry of the data, one is the randomness that is inherent in the data and the third is the complexity. Okay. The first thing the geometry obviously because these are functions rather than just vectors, see in, in vectors you can have these tuples arranged in any possible way so i can i do not have a particular notion of what is the first element of, of the tuple or the second element of a tuple i can just rearrange things okay but here i cannot do that because if i do that then the function in, inherently would change there is a particular ordering so for example if i am having a function observed over the domain called time i just cannot simply juxtapose different time points because that would give me a completely different function Okay. And also because these things are nice 
uh, elements of some function space. So there is an inherent infinite dim dimensional geometry that is already there. And one has to need, one has to take care of that infinite dimensional geometry in order to, to develop proper statistical methods for such data. The second thing is randomness, obviously, because these, this, these are random samples. So one need, one need to look at probability distributions in an infinite dimensional space in order to understand uh, these, these, these things. Okay. And the complexity comes in uh, because inherently what, what, we, we, what we see typically in functional data is that although we are working in an, in an infinite dimensional space, quite often it may be possible to reduce the structure to some lower dimensional space in a, in a sense that maybe most of the, of the variation in the, in the data is lying in some lower dimensional space and one can actually leverage this, this fact. Okay. So these, these are the, are the three uh, cornerstones. Okay, so this is the L2 setup. So we have, so we want to probe into the law of the, of the random function xt. We have n iid re realizations, these xits, and each xit we assume to lie in some L2 space. So this is the space of square integrable functions over AB. Okay, AB could be some compact set. So how do we first define the mean? So the way the, the mean is defined is a very natural analog of how we define it in, in, the, in, the, in the multivariate setting. So now we have a mean function, m of t, and m of t is nothing but the expected value of x of t. Okay, so for each time point, we get, we, we get the expectation, and that defines a function. Okay? And this m also lies in L2 AB. Okay, so this, is the, this characterizes the location of, of that function, in essence. What is the average location of that function? Now, what is the, how do we, how do we, how do we take care of, of, the vari, of the variation in the function? So that is taken care of through the, through the covariance kernel. So instead of now a covariance, or instead of having a covariance matrix like we do for a multivariate data, we now have a covariance kernel. So this is a function indexed by T and S, where T and S both lie in A, B. And K, T, S is nothing but the, the covariance between X, T and X, S. I'm looking at how these things vary or co-vary at time points T and at time points S. Okay. And this characterizes the fluctuations of the, of the random variable of, or, or the random function around its mean. But these things, I mean, this covariance kernel is still intrinsically an, an infinite dimensional object. So is there a way to maybe separate out the, the infinite dimensional part, the stochastic part, and all of these things? Well, there is. And this is the very famous uh, Karun and Loew expansion uh, named on two people, Karun and, and Michel Loew. And this, essentially what it does is it decomposes the, the, the variation. So this xt minus mt, so if you look at the centered random function, so xt minus mt, note that this is essentially a random function. So there is a time component and there is also the randomness. Okay. So what it does, the, what this expansion does is it decomposes this xt minus, in, minus mt as an infinite sum. The infinite sum, if you look at it very carefully, this is psi n's, which are these things, the inner product between x minus m and phi n. This, these are called the principal component scores and these are zero mean uncorrelated random variables. Okay. And this psi n is multiplied by this phi n of t. Okay. So this is the current and wave expansion. And what it does is the following. So this xt was essentially a function of t and also of this randomness. So if I can think about a probability space, so xt is, is essentially xt of omega. Okay. So there is an inherent probability space and x is a, is a random function over there. So what this thing does is essentially it brings all the, all the randomness or the, the mapping from omega those things come in this psi n, okay? And all the functional part that is there, that comes in phi n t. So phi n t are deterministic functions, okay? So this is a kind of a separation of variables. In a sense, now I have a stochastic part, which is this part, and I have a purely functional part, which is this phi n t part. So I've been able to decompose this xt minus mt into the stochastic part and the functional part, okay? So there is no functionality here. These are very nice random variables. There is no stochastic component here because phi and t's are all deterministic functions. Okay. And this, this expansion or this decomposition is extremely useful when it comes to developing statistical analysis of functional data because now we understand how, the fun how these random functions, how they behave, what is their degree of smoothness, how much do they vary or do they fluctuate around the mean, all sorts of these kind of things we can understand from just this particular expansion. Okay. And this is very, very fundamental when it comes to functional data analysis, the current low wave expansion. Okay. okay. And also this is uh, heavily used when it comes to modeling and methodology, 
and the inference and regularization, if, if all of all of these things. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples or a few situations uh, as we pro progress. <laughs> okay, so this is, an, uh, this is a toy example of the cardinal law of expansion for Brownian motion. So this is the standard Brownian motion. I, I believe I do not have to explain what Brownian motion is. All of us pretty much know. And so the, if you look at the cardinal law of expansion for Brownian motion, this is what it turns out to be. So this root to the sinusoidal functions are essentially what the phi and t's are. And these uh, xi n's are independent normal random variables. So if I look at the plots of each of these zkt's, so these sums over here, and this will be an n, sorry, a tiny little typo. So if we look at it, so essentially we start off with smooth functions or other very, like not very undulated functions because these are these low frequency sinusoidal comp components. And as we go up, the frequency of the, of the sinusoidal components, they kind of become bigger and bigger. So essentially because we all know that Brownian motion is a continuous nowhere differentiable function almost surely. So it is just essentially because of these infinite sum of sinusoidal components that we have that property. Okay. So to start with, we start off with very smooth functions, these sine functions. And then as we, as we move in n or in this index n, we start adding very high frequency sine components. Okay. Okay, so this is the current law of expansion for Brownian motion. Okay, so this is a little bit of a history as to uh, the uh, part of the, as to the, the development of FDA. So I mentioned about Karunan and Loeb. They used it for linear filtering of a, of a stochastic process. Uh, Ulf Granander was a very famous person uh, in working in FDA. So he used these coordinate representations for likelihood ratio. CRL used this uh, for, for, for analysis of growth curves, the components of variation interpretation. And then Cleffe uh, and the Duxois, Pousset and Homo, they, they used it for, for the development of the asymptotics of the empirical covariance matrix and so on and so forth. Uh, Bessie and Ramsey used or developed a version of principal component analysis for functional data, the so-called functional principal component analysis. And then the subject essentially takes off. So from 90s onwards, there was a lot of development going on in, in principal component, in, fu in functional data analysis. And from 2000s, it was really a very, very expanding field. Okay. And it still remains the, to this day. Okay, so I will first, I'll talk about two uh, brief uh, uh, things. So one is uh, functional linear models because uh, all of us are pretty much using linear models every day. So the functional linear model essentially is a, is a, it's a generalization of the standard multivariate linear model that, that we see or the univariate linear model that we see, y equals to alpha plus beta x. So that's essentially, so this is essentially a general generalization of that where we have say for example y which is the, the which is a scalar response and we have a functional covariate now, this x. And so we write the, the linear model in this way, y equals to alpha plus inner product of x beta because now x is some random function in L2 AB. So we can talk about inner product. So we have, a, we have a Hilbert space structure in mind. So we can talk about inner products and so on and so forth. So we have a, fun, a, a model of this kind, y equals to alpha plus inner product x beta plus epsilon. Okay. So if you look at this model or if you try to think about this model from the multivariate perspective, this in the multivariate setting would transform to beta transpose x as we see it. Okay. okay. And typically beta is the, is the parameter of interest because if we estimate beta then this alpha can be estimated as y minus this inner product. Okay. okay. Now uh, all of us are pretty much aware of the method of least squares. A similar thing can also be done here in the method of least squares. But the problem now becomes that because we are now dealing with an infinite dimensional object the estimation through the uh, method of least squares, that becomes an ill-posed problem. It is an ill-posed inverse problem and for that we need to actually go through a proper regularized estimator. Okay. So, that, so this becomes an ill-posed inverse problem simply because this k hat cannot be inverted. It, this is a result in functional analysis. If you have a compact self-adjoint op operator, then its inverse is, is obviously not bounded. Okay. And that this is a similar problem that happens here. Okay. Um, if we try to solve it even in the empirical case, we are faced with this kind of an estimator which is quite, uh, has a lot of variability uh, because we are trying to use these lambda j inverses. So these, these are the sequence of estimated eigenvalues of that operator and these eigenvalue sequences goes to zero or decays to, to zero. So their inverse kind of inflates. Okay. So this is a very, uh, this is an estimator with high variability. And so we need to be very careful about how we choose uh, this n here, okay. And that brings us to uh, the need for regularization when doing an estimation in the functional linear model. And when one can do one of 
two uh, very uh, canonical regular regularization techniques. One is the sieve method. So essentially, you project your data onto a lower dimensional space, solve the optimization problem there, and then do the asymptotics in a way that if once you have more and more data points, you let your sieve become bigger and bigger. That's what essentially you're doing. So think of a sieve that we use every day when uh, when uh, trying to make tea, and we are making that sieve bigger and bigger so that we can uh, have more and more tea leaves go going through. Okay. And the other is, is, a, is a penalization technique, uh, the so-called Tikhonov regular, regularization. If we, many of us would have heard about the term ridge regression for multivariate data set, this is essentially the infinite dimensional version of ridge, ridge reg regression. Okay. So we add a little bit of a uh, trace to it and then make it invertible, make, make that k hat invertible. Okay. So these are the two essential means. Uh, and so the whole idea in functional lin linear models essentially uh, revolves around these two regularization techniques and one can do a lot of statistical analysis once we actually un, uh, go through these two uh, regularization techniques and one can produce nice consistent estimators of the underlying of the unknown beta parameter that, that I have. So that's essentially what uh, the, 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 lean, the functional linear models is all about. The, the next problem that I would want to consider is something called functional classification and the, there's a good reason why I want, wanted to, to study because I want, want to mention a very very interesting fact that happens when we do classification for, for functional data. Okay. So all of us pretty much have an idea as to what classification is. We have two different cl classes and uh, the, the, the so-called training data, data set and then we have a new observation and we want to classify that new observation to one of these two training data sets. Okay. Either it is from class 1 or it is from class 2. In the standard, in the standard multivariate setting, this is a very well known problem and, and it has a proper sol solution, there is no problem with, with that. Okay. But the, that solution actually is problematic when we move to functional data settings because that solution inherently involves estimation of a density, okay, if, of a probability den density. But obviously what is a probability density in an infinite dimensional setting, that is a, that's a difficult question to answer. So we need to find out ways around uh, the solving of, of probability densities to get to a solution for the functional classification problem. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what we do is so one of the uh, one of the well-known techniques is to, to use a centroid classifier. So essentially, we are looking at the means of the two populations and then trying to classify the new observation to one of these classes based on its proximity to the one of to the two means. Okay, so whichever so whichever mean that new function is closer to, we'll classify it to that class. That's a very naive idea of what is a, what a centroid classifier is. Okay. And so there is obviously a, a misclassification problem because always in statistics we do some kind of an error of an error and the misclassification probability turns out to be of this form. Okay, the form is not important but what is important is the fact that there is a, a misclassification probability that, that we are or a misclassification error that we can find out and the very interesting fact is that there are situations obviously the situation or what these situations are will depend on the on the, co on the covariance structure of these two data sets and will also depend on the means of these two data sets. But there is, there is a very nice condition wherein we can actually have perfect classification for functional data. Now when I say perfect classification, it essentially means I will be able to make zero error in classifying from exactly from which class that new data point is. Now this is unthinkable in the multivariate setting because never in the in the multivariate setting unless until you have a very like a toy example this cannot happen in, in the in the multivariate setting you cannot have perfect classification but the very interesting fact in for at least for functional data is that this the infinite dimensional nature of, of this problem essentially has a scenario where we can actually talk about what a perfect classification situation. So this under this condition, I am not explaining what this condition is, so under this condition essentially we can have a perfect classification going on. And this is a very, very striking difference between the, the standard multivariate setting and this functional setting because this is unthinkable in the standard multivariate setting. Okay. And in fact, and this is happening just pure, just by, by using a very naive classifier, this, this, this centroid classifier. And actually one can show that this is not, this is no accident because the this, this centroid classifier is actually giving or in the limit is giving us the base classifier. Okay, base classifier based on the likelihood ratio. And this situation is essentially what is called the mutual orthogonality of two, 
of two di of two distributions wherein you have disjoint supports. Okay, this is a, this is a result in probability theory. It's a very famous result uh, started with Kakutani called something called Kakutani's dichotomy. And from there on, you can actually show that there are, if you look at, say, Gaussian measures on an Hilbert space, then they're either mutually sing singular or they are equivalent in nature. Okay. So this was a very classical paper in Sankhya by C. R. Rao and V. S. Varadarajan, uh, where, wherein they show that this phenomenon is not too uh, weird in when you look at the functional setting. Okay. Um, the last thing that I would want, want to mention in whatever ta time I have is that uh, in practice, uh, so all of these things that, that I mentioned was with fully observed functions, but obviously you do not get to observe a function fully even in a, in a, in a computer. So what you have is essentially discretely observed functions. So you observe each function at discrete many time points. And then uh, what you have is, and, all, and also these are observations that you have may or may not be contaminated with measurement errors. Okay. So you need to look at the model of this kind where you observe these xi's at the points t i j. And you can have an additive measurement error, these epsilon ij's. So what you get to observe are these w ij's instead of the functions x ij's. Okay. And all of these things that I mentioned, these the functional linear models, the classification, all of these things can be adapted or can be modified to a scenario where you have measurement errors in your in your in your data set. Okay. And there are there are several techniques uh, to handle measurement errors in your data set. And there are there are several th two very useful ways. Are one would be to smooth these individual functions and the other would be to pool the entire dat data set and then do statistical an analysis. So essentially these two uh, approaches and there are several uh, like ramifications as to how these two uh, approaches behave or how these statistical methods behave if you have say very s uh, fine grid points or if you have sparse grid points all of these things kind of play a very crucial role when you are doing statistical analysis for for discretely observed functional data. Okay. I have run out of time, I will not bore you for more, but the only thing that I wanted to, to kind of mention or convey through my talk was that this is a very, very interesting field and, and it's still uh, there are several unexplored areas in this field where even mathematicians, because it involves a lot of functional analysis, have a lot of say in it. And uh, in total, I mean, this is a very, very nice, nice field to work with and still one of the frontline research areas in, in statistics, okay. I will thank you and stop here if you have any more questions.